everybody, Matt here from Matt's Movies, Music and More and my special guest Andrew welcoming you to this week's episode of What Did You Think? I thought I put a bit of emphasis in my voice there. It was very well done. Yes, thank you. I have to try and mix it up every now and then. So if you saw our last episode of What Did You Think? You'll have noticed that we covered the 1973 British horror film Psychomania. Which was an experience. <laughs> Do check that out. Yep. Yeah. And um, to replace that on the Twister Spinner for horror, we have put in there Brain Scan, yeah. which is Edward Furlong and Frank Langella. Okay. Okay. And to replace this movie, which today's movie comes from the comedy genre, we are replacing it with the 1992 comedy classic My Cousin Vinny. Okay, yeah, there's definitely one of those titles. I know the title, but I don't think I've seen it itself. Okay. So, um, on to today's film then. So, today's film we are doing is the... I got the year wrong, so I will cover it now. Which is the, yeah. It is the 1986 British comedy Clockwise, which is... Pardon? Yeah, Clockwise. Clock, oh, sorry, I thought you said something else instead of clock. For a moment oh, very funny. Very funny. That's your dirty mind, that is. I think it's a lot of people's dirty mind, so... Okay. I put it out there, so let's... Yep. let's Forget that now. Yep. So the movie we're doing today is the 1986 classic Clockwise, Clockwise yeah. directed by Christopher Moran, and it stars John Cleese, Penelope Wilton, Alison Stedman, and Sharon Maiden as Laura. So, Clockwise. Clockwise. Yes, yes. I've got it. Have you seen it in before it came up on the Twisty Spinner? I'm pretty sure, but I, I, as a child um, in the early 90s, they started rerunning uh, Monty Python's Flying Circus on the BBC, and I became very attached to that, became a huge fan of that. So from there, um, early teens, mid-teens, I did certainly, there was a point where I started searching out any film with the Monty Python team in it not just the monty python films themselves but anything like from that from that period the 80s to the mid 90s to the yeah mid 90s like time bandits or uh splitting airs or um yeah this yeah so um can you try and describe the plot for me um, well it's a very straightforward uh premise um a comedy farcical premise um John Cleese is Basil Fawlty. No, sorry, no, he's Brian Stimson, uh, the headmaster of Thomas Tompion Comprehensive School. So it's one of those um, pub, um, one of those um, more mainstream schools, and he's the headmaster who, from virtually the opening seconds of this movie, can, you can see he has a reputation for, uh, for, as the title suggests, running like clockwork. He's extremely um organized to a absurd degree of where every pupil and every teacher and every class needs to be at any given time you've got or, or you have got two minutes to get to your class and you need to be ready for the ten thirty five science class tomorrow morning and um where are you going you should have been at your um block uh, five minutes ago so he's got a reputation that means he runs a very tight ship he's you know he's very good at his job. And, and that's where the clock time of 9.20 always comes in handy, isn't it? That's the running joke. He's like, you there, 9.20. Like that. So even the teachers, he's like, oh, not you, you, 9.20. Even the teachers are afraid of him. <laughs> yeah. So I think because of this, he has just been recently elected to chair the upcoming annual Headmasters Conference, which, as this is usually chaired and run by a whole bunch of elitist public school headmaster types, this is not only a big deal for the, the conference in general, but it's, it's a moment of pride for him. And he's got his speech. He is From the start of the movie, he's rehearsing it and thinking in his head about what he is going to say. And it involves getting the train to uh, Norwich, Norwich yeah. uh, which his uh, wife drives him to. And even though the wife says, I could drive you there. To, no, no, I'm sure you've got um, you've got li little old ladies to look after. I'll be I'll be fine, dear. I've got everything under control. I've got my briefcase. 
and uh, purely because I think he's distracted by some students that are bunking off and shouldn't be there. But there's, whilst he's saying this, is um, there's a train on the left and the train on the right, and purely because of the quirk of the English language that um, right could mean right, or right as in okay. So right, 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 right. Yeah, right, right. Okay, he gets on that train and um, sees that the next train, the train next to him, is about to go off. Is it? Well, is this the Norwich train? No, sir. This is the Plymouth train. The Norwich <laughs> one is over there. At which point, everything, and I do mean everything, and his perfectly organised, under control life falls apart horribly. Yeah. He misses the train. Not only that, but in his mad rush. There's panic. He left his briefcase on the Plymouth train, which then goes off. So he's not. He's got no speech, and he thinks he can get to his wife. But his wife assumes that he, because he's Peter Perfect, that he will have got on the train. He's she's already gone off. So in his frantic um, scrambling around for any kind of transport whatsoever, he sees um, Laura, a sixth form student who's bunking off in her car, which he would normally see as an opportunity to reprimand, but now he's desperate for any means to get there. So he's forcing Laura to drive off the, on the road to the Norwich conference. But from there, not only is it will he will they get there on time, but a whole bunch of other factors come into play very quickly. One is the concerned parents of Laura because they she's stolen the car. She's not registered to drive. So they're on their tail. There's um another teacher, uh, Mr. Mr. Jolly. Mr. Yeah, that is his name, Mr. Jolly. Never mind, music teacher. I'm sure we've had somebody named like that who's going to Norwich because Laura is secretly having something. I think uh, Mr. Jolly tried to tell uh, Mr. Stimson earlier, but he wasn't listening. Yeah. Um, the wife, uh, Alison Steadman, the wife of Mr. Stimson, sees them at the petrol station, Mr. Stimson, with this younger girl and um, comes to the wrong conclusion. So she has to, to go, we have to get after them. With whilst, the old with, with the old ladies from the hospital. Oh, are we having a day out? Oh, this is nice. Yeah. Don't forget the sherry glasses. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. so there's that and that, and of course, in the <laughs> frantic dash to get to Norwich, all the um, attention, unwanted attention from the police that they'll attract along the way. So, shenanigans. Yes, it's um, it kind of feels like um, it could easily be just a ninety-minute episode of Forty Towers, which is why it surprises me to find out that this movie isn't written by John Cleese at all. No, but he was he was cast in this. The script was written, and then he got cast in it. But it does seem like it could easily be Forty Towers because he is basically playing Tazzle. I, I think it's a almost a universal truth that with some actors they become so associated with a role or a particular type of um, performance that um, they'll get cast in anything. Or if you watch them on screen, you will instantly think it's that character which is why i think a big part of this movie for a lot of people watching it is just oh it's basil faulty not just not just because he's put upon because he's putting a um i think the moustache makes the difference yeah, too uh, put in a terrible situation but especially how he reacts to everything um i think I can't remember. It does he whack a car with a fig leaf or come very close to it? Maybe, maybe it's like a little nod back. Um, I will say this up front first before we get on to the rest of the movie. But um, okay. given that this movie costs four million dollars to uh, four million pounds to make pounds, this, yeah. is, a, this is a profoundly yeah. British four million movie. pounds. Yes, it took a American gross of about a million and a half dollars. So this movie was never gonna. Um, Exactly, set the box office on fire in America. I'd say. I've heard, I've, I've read up that um, it played in maybe a couple of art house theatres, or it didn't take off because it is a profoundly British movie with a British sense of humour. I've heard. I think what clinched it is is that um, there is a scene that I'm sure you'd like to talk about where. Um, in desperate to phone up the man at the headmaster's conference to let them know he'll be late, they come across a town and a row of phone boxes, one after the other, 
these phone boxes do not work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, or he he tries, but then he runs out of money. And I've heard that that scene didn't play to complete silence in America because American phone booths are always working. Yes. And I've heard from from the underperformance of this movie. I don't know if it was the key um, decision or factor, or it may have been a helped spark John Cleese to say, right, I'm going to make a mainstream movie. I'm going to make a movie with American actors that American audiences will get because I'm tired of not being appreciated. And thus, um, A Fish Called Wanda eventually came into play. I'm so glad you said that because that was exactly what I wanted to say. So that's really good that we're on the same wavelength there. Yeah. But um, regarding... Um, some little facts about this movie before we get into the actors and the directors and stuff. Yeah. Um, I want to mention about the name of the school. It's not a real... The name isn't the real name of the school, but apparently this name, Thomas... Tompion, Tompion, yeah. Yeah, Tompion. Apparently uh, they got that name because that particular person was um, a 17th century English clockmaker. That kind of shows you what the, this is a script writer who knows exactly what he is doing. He's putting in a cultural reference. Yeah. and um, With meaning and symbolism. And what do you think of the, um, the, the way it shows um, England and the countryside? I mean, it, it, it's like a road movie, really. It, a, a good chunk of this movie is John Cleese in a car driving along the motorway or along the countryside, yes. And the countryside looks beautiful, the way it's shot in the film. In Shropshire, I think. Yeah, I mean, they go from different areas to, like, being stuck in a field, and you can hear the accents, the regional accents, yeah. which in America they probably wouldn't understand without subtitles, I'm Be guessing. Because farmers are hilarious. Yeah. I bet you were jam tart that I phoned a tractor first, you know, and... Um, Things um, like um, when uh, he, he's vandalising the phone boxes and the, like, the woman watching from the window is like, they're vandalising those phones again. Uh, that woman, uh, Sheila Keefe, famous for being um, in the Pete Walker horror films. There's a lot of um, British character actors that are in this film, such as, um, can we start with um, the three old ladies? I don't know all the names of all of them, but one of them is led by Joan Hickson, which is the woman who's constantly going on about the sherry glasses. Yeah. And one of them, who um, I believe her name is Anne, um, she was Mrs. Hall in Forty Towers. So there is a Forty Towers link there. Yeah. And um, you've got that. You've got um, one of my favourite um, British uh, character actors from television, Geoffrey Palmer, who's in this. Be and because he... there are a couple of headmasters waiting at the conference. Where's Mr. Stimson? And uh, Oh, I suppose we could do the speech. We would rather do the speech. And um, and then it, as more and more people get angry and aggravated chasing after John Cleese, more of them turn up at the conference going, where is he? And um, Jeffrey Palmer, can you look after these people? And this conference turns into a farcical here's the waiting room oh are you here for brian stimson and police inspector so and so we're looking for mr stimson yes the waiting room is over there with all the other people stimson supporter class yep just this way just this way so he would do things like he, he steals the show even though he's in it very minimal um but i think the actors in this movie are great i mean um, penelope wilton who um, plays pat yeah she's like um it's not really said, but I think she's an ex-girlfriend. She's an ex-girlfriend, ex uh, and she's there to go, oh, um, he wasn't always this organised. Oh, he was a terrible um, muddled mess at um, school when I knew him. Yeah. I mean, Alison Stepan and, as and, well. And, uh, oh, just with Pe Penelope P. Wilton, uh, Harriet Jones, former Prime Minister. Okay. Yeah, okay, I've... I don't promise I won't do any more Doctor Who references. No, that's fine, that's fine. Anytime you want to we, mention that, it's great. We, we know who she is. Yeah. Uh, See, uh, Alison Stedman, who plays um, Brian's wife, um, She, I think she's quite underused in this, personally. A little. She's just there to be the um, put-upon or misunderstood, the, the wife who misunderstands the situation, and that's about it, really. And um, you've got, um, I, again, I'm not going to mention all the actors' names, because I don't know all the actors' names, but um, you have, um, at the train station, beginning of the movie, pretty much, in which um, he's asking the train conductor, which train is it? He goes, oh, it's that one on the left. And he's like, left? And then he obviously notices the, the kids. Or and, that's a, and that's when they'll write. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, the um, the train conductor is played um, by the actor who played uh, Jim Branning in um, EastEnders. So um, I recognised him straight away. If you watch Only Fools and Horses, he was also a security guard in one episode of the show. Um, but he's brilliant because there's a bit where the line comes up where he says to him, he goes, he goes, that's Norwich on the left. And he goes, you don't want Norwich. And he's like, speech, speech. He's like, speech. He says, I've been asked many things before. I've never been asked to make a speech before. And then obviously because the guy misunderstands him on the uh, Plymouth train to give him his speech and suitcase back, it just ends up taking off. And so when he comes back and he's like, damn it. And he's like, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, he's like, what time's the train to the next train to Norwich? He's like, oh, you have to change at Peterborough. It'd be at like 4.30. He's like, <gasps> he's like, he didn't like it. I just love that. I think it's so funny. It's a stupid, it's a stupid joke, but it's funny. It, when it's when it's performed and executed, you know, it makes all the difference. Yeah, I mean, I'm no actor or anything like that, but I mean, this is a weird movie because if you want to watch a laugh out loud comedy, this isn't one for you. This is more a British kind of series of unfortunate events kind of comedy. It's a farce and it is structured and uh, played exactly like a good old English theatrical farce with um, the, the setup and then it's um, incident upon incident upon incident. It all keeps building up for this poor character up until he winds up muddied and dishevelled in a monastery. And its ending kind of feels a bit like the ending of Monty Python and the Holy Grail. It just sort of abruptly ends kind of thing. It, yeah, um, I don't know if... Um, I am inclined to believe that um, the scriptwriter just ran out of um, interest or steam and said, all right, we have to get here eventually. Let's just get here. Fine, we've done it. Can we all go home now? Mm. The, the marketing for this movie must have been really weird back in 1986 when it came out because um, as a kid, um, the image that you see on the screen, that was the video and movie poster art, which was um, it shows Mr. Simpson having a bath. That was the poster for the UK film. So if yeah. you were to go into that movie and go, why is John Cleese in a bath? You wouldn't know what the hell the movie's all about, no. The American cover art, which it's okay, it's nothing special, is at least it's got John Cleese sandwiched between two clock faces, one either either side. Yeah, that'd be, I can see that being more symbolic yeah. and representative of the movie. But again, yeah. the marketing for this movie must have been really weird. I mean, I've seen, um, thanks to YouTube, um, I've seen um, Siskel and Ebert's uh, opinion of this movie, and mm -hmm. they both had, um, uh, they didn't really rate it very much at all, and they did say that this movie is really a far too long movie. It kind of feels like a 20-minute sort of sketch film. It's been it's stretched out. So yeah, really. yeah. But, I mean, like I say, I mean, this is a movie that, I'll be honest, I haven't seen it on telly for years, but this used to be one of those holiday staple movies that whenever there was like Easter or a bank holiday weekend or something, this would be on telly like Flash Gordon would be and a few other classic um, movies from the 70s and 80s and stuff and Clockwise would be on often. And um, yeah, I mean, I like this movie a lot, but that's because I'm biased to John Cleese and Monty Python. But as a laugh out loud comedy, it's not one of those. For me, it's just, if you like... The American comedy show Kirby Enthusiasm with Larry David, which everything he does is always misunderstood or series of unfortunate events. It's kind of like this character, pretty much, except he doesn't swear as much. I mean, this is more of a family comedy, I'd say. There's nothing really bad in it, no bad language, yeah. apart from the odd um, sort of British swear. But to some extent, I mean, that's, that's getawayable, you know, but uh, yeah. it is a very, very odd movie for a box office film. I can imagine this doing all right if it was made for television, I'd say. Probably. Um, I think even as a child, uh, a teenager, even as a teenager watching it, I just kind of dismissed it. I mean, I could see the laughs in there, I could see the jokes, but I could just kind of see it as just, oh, it's just John Cleese doing more Faulty Towers shtick, and I didn't think much of Faulty Towers to begin with. Yes, I said it. Come at me. Um, but um, looking at it now and being all um, analytical and um, um, 
trying to deconstruct this, which I probably shouldn't do with it. I should just go with it as a, as a, a basic comedy. I get that. But um, seeing the credits for this movie, uh, directed by, as you say, directed by Christopher Morhan, who has a background. He's done some films, but he has more of a background in theatre. And it was produced by Michael Codron, who similarly um, is an actor who's done well in the theatre biz since then. And with that, it all kind of came together for me because I've worked in theatres. I've, I've become very accustomed to um, theatre and the uh, genres and the types of plays that you get there. And it, it is a good, at its heart, it's scripted and written as a good old thing fashioned English um, theatrical farce. It's just it's driving around in the countryside with a slightly bigger budget. I almost I could almost see you could boil this down and put this on stage. Um, slight tangent, but uh, watching this again many years later, it did remind me of a movie that must have come out around the same time, which I can't remember its name, but I saw it on, casually on a Monday afternoon recently. It had Warren Mitchell, um, okay. Anna Massey and um, Nigel Hawthorne in it and it was about a removal moving house company and it's about Warren Mitchell as the um, removal man and dealing with all these people and all the shenanigans they get into like oh no we've been taken to the wrong house or okay. oh no we've been scammed or we're going to lose our property or my boyfriend wants to move back in what do I do Warren Mitchell and Warren Mitchell is the calm voice of reason which you don't associate with Alf Garnet but um I, I, did I don't know the name of that movie. So no, I'll have I don't to, if anyone could, there'll be a graphic on the screen once if, I found if it. If you out. can find it out and put it up, but it had the exact same kind of budget and it had the exact same theatrical. Must have been a play of some kind or thought of by the scriptwriter with a theatrical farce mentality, and that does with this and that makes me think. Just this funny period in the mid eighties when I don't know if this is what. Thatcher did to the British film industry that um, everybody just had to make these cheap um, comedies. Mm, mm. But I mean, the fact it cost four million pounds, a lot of money. And a, a funny, uh, you can even see, you can see it's a product of its time with the whole elitist public school headmasters at this conference going, oh, I'll do a speech about money. That <laughs> always works. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mean, um, anything else you want to wrap up about clockwise? Because, um, to be honest, I mean, yeah, it, it's one of those movies that's always stuck with me, and I quote it a lot to this day. Mm. The whole he didn't like it speech, I just love that, I think it's so funny. Or the oh, did you stop for um petrol today, sir? No, we got it yesterday when they stole petrol, yeah, when they've stolen petrol, uh, or a monastery. What's he doing? Where's where is Mr. Simpson? He's having a bath, a bath. You know, it's uh, and Stimson Supporters Club as well and stuff like that. You know, there's just so many funny lines in it. Yeah. Where do you think you're going, Clint? The Guinness Book of Records? He goes, every morning we have the same problem. Remember, 9.20. Mm. And then this huge corridor of kids just waiting to go and see him at 9.20. Yeah. I'm kind of thinking, why does he not stagger the time? Because he's not going to be able to see them all at 9.20. Mm. Um, if you um, have seen A Fish Called Wanda, then maybe check this out for curiosity's sake. Or if you've seen Forty Towers, check this out for curiosity's sake. It's probably not something I could recommend as a comic masterpiece Agreed. like yourself. But it's all. It's John Cleese. He, can, he carries this movie. It's got a charm. It's, it's all right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I like it, but I mean, like I say, it's not it's not stand out. Uh, it's not the best thing he's ever done, but it's enjoyable and it's it's ninety minutes that I I can easily just channel it, hop and watch it. It does kind of breeze past. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I suppose that's quite quite. And right on time. Yep. So you we'll see what I did there. Yep. So it's twist the spinner time. Yeah, literally on time. Um, so. After going from clockwise, sorry, clockwise, clockwise. Okay, so um, let's see what it lands on next, I guess. It's landed on family. Okay. 
So what is on the family pick? Do tell. The 1990 movie, The Witches, which is based on the book by Roald Dahl. Oh, I loved him as a child, so that gives me something to hold on good a uh, hook the next time. Cool. So thank you very much, everybody, for checking out today's video. What did you think of Clockwise? Yeah. Have you guys seen it? Did you think it was good? Did you think it was average? Um, give us some comments and feedback. Let can us you, know. Can you tell me what it, that movie is? Or the title of that movie is, I'm trying to remember. The Warren uh, Mitchell and Anna Massey movie, yes. That Nigel Hawthorne, that helps. Okay. Yeah, excellent. Um, and um, if you go on uh, Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, you can check out and um, share it with us and tell us what you think. And uh, we we'll look forward to seeing you on the very next episode. So thanks very much, everybody. And um, Andrew, final closing statement for this movie? Remember, 9.20. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Goodbye.